All right. Y'all got to just do y'all's part to sing louder than this side over here this morning. If you will, stand with me. Let's start off singing. Page 361. We have come into this house. Tiffany, if you've got something you want to announce, you let her know. I told her we were going to put one of them things in here that we were selling ad space. If anybody wants to advertise their business, because we don't have any bulletin stuff. We're not able to do much right now, and so we don't have a lot of stuff in the bulletin. So if you'd like to advertise your business, no, I'm playing. <laughs> On a cash basis, get with your pastor. And uh, <laughs> No, we appreciate you being here today. Um, Happy New Year to you. Also, we're doing Chris Bo- uh, Christmas shoebox stuff. There is information in your bulletin about what we need for February, uh, January and February also, uh, and, and continue to pray with us on our Wednesday night. Miss Kay's been helping us out on Wednesday night. Um, she, she's ready for somebody else to help us out with that. And so if that's something you feel led to do uh, on Wednesday night children's ministry, let us know. Uh, but we appreciate her standing in and taking care of that uh, and always does a good job. So praying about that. So pray with us about that. If that's something you'd like to help us with in this new year, please let us know. Um, also want to remind you that on Wednesday night, um, 6.30 Wednesday night, uh, we're starting this week, we're doing a, a Bible study. It's going to be, I say Bible study, I'm leading it, but it's going to be a, a, a foundational truths Bible study. Uh, and it's going to be a blessing to you if you'll come. I want to encourage you to be here for that. I, I want us to be grounded on some things. And this is not a, a Baptist thing, this is a Bible thing. Uh, and I want us to know who we are according to the Word of God. And I want us to know it and, and, and have confidence in it. Because we, uh, we're, in a, we're in a challenging time for our country and in our lives and in the church. Uh, and it's never been more important for us to know exactly who we are. And so that's our heart in that. And so we'd love to invite you to come. If you don't normally come on Wednesday nights, come. Uh, we're, we're real laid back. We don't do any kind of singing or anything. We just come in, read our prayer list, and have Bible study. So come on down. We'd love to have you for that. All right. Any other announcement? Excited that we're having baptism following the service. Looking forward to that. Mr. Carson got saved, kind of made a profession of faith last week. And Dejo's going to be baptizing him this morning. We're excited about that uh, for both of them. Praise the Lord for it. There's nothing else? Y'all ready to have church? All right. Visitors, welcome. Thank you for coming and being a part of this service. Father, we love you. Thank you today for the privilege we have to be in your house and, God, in your presence. I ask you this morning, Lord, just to move in this place. Uh, God, we didn't come here today just to be entertained or come here just to check something off a list. Uh, We've come to gather in your name and worship you. And I pray that you be magnified and glorified in this place. Help us, Lord, as we sing. Help us as we preach. That what we do be pleasing to you and also be effective in the hearts of all those who are here. We pray today, Lord, that if there's somebody that needs to be saved, they might be saved in this service. God, we ask you to just move in in power and and let us know your presence today as you move in this place. And God, we pray that your word will penetrate our hearts and accomplish your will today. We love you. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship. We pray we'll make the most of it. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, let's sing page 212. I love you, Lord.
chapter 13. Gospel of Luke in chapter 13 is where we'll be uh, for a little while today. Um, if you remember, you may not, I think it was when we were all straight online, but uh, the first part of this chapter we preached back earlier in the year, uh, and we talked about uh, for us not to miss an opportunity to repent, as the Bible talks about a group of people who had experienced great tragedy, and some who had seen what had happened had come and posed the question to the Lord, basically had they experienced this heartache or this hardship because of some sin? And Jesus tells them that unless you repent, you're going to likewise perish. Basically saying, mind your business, you need to get right with the Lord too. Instead of worrying about why they're suffering, what you need to do is be thankful that God's not caused this to come upon you. And so as we look to that, he continues on. I'm going to get you to stand with me, if you will, as we honor God's word. He continues on in verse 6, on the hills of challenging these people to repent. He says that, or the Bible says that he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And then he said to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground, or why troubleth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. I, I want to grab a hold of this thought and preach a message to you as the Lord gives us liberty that we've titled One More Year. Father, we ask you this morning in Jesus' name to use this opportunity to open our hearts, open our minds, and listen. And Spirit of the Lord, as you speak, I pray that we give you freedom in our heart to work. And if there's something in this place that needs to be done, I pray that it be done this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the reality is, they had another year. And after we got through what we've gotten through, and we are where we are, we found ourselves in another year. A lot of people didn't think we'd survive 2020, and I don't know that we came through it with flying colors, but we made it. Here we are. I, I want to remind you of a few things. The Church of the Living God was founded by the Lord Jesus Christ in his personal ministry. It was empowered at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the church. But I want to remind us this morning that for 1776 years, the New Testament church did just fine without America. And if America ever ceases to be, I want you to know that the church of the living God is going to be fine. I want you to understand this morning that America needs the church, not the other way around. And the reason that we've seen the days that we have all heralded as the prosperous and good days and the grace that's been shed on us as a country is because of the favor of God on the churches of this land. It's because of the people of God who coveted together to see that our nation serve as a lighthouse to the rest of this world. I don't know another nation that'll bomb you and then come back and fix your country better than it was before we showed up. We've done everything it seems in our power. They hate us. They want to kill us. They want to take everything we've got until they have an earthquake. Until there's a tsunami. Until there's some mass disaster. Then where are the United States of America? Well, they're first. To show up, to lend a helping hand, and to mend fences around the world. We've seen this throughout our lifetime. Our country has ran to the aid of even our adversaries to help and to strengthen and to supply for them in their greatest times of need. And yet we find ourselves in a day in our country, you've heard the expression that you bite the hand that feeds you? That God has been so good to us as a country, and yet we find ourselves adamantly dismissing him from our nation. 
And what we've seen in the last four years, not by any means to politics, but what we've seen in the last four years was a almost a reaction of the Lord's people that said we didn't want to go any further the way we were going. And now what we're experiencing is the knee jerk or the swinging of the pendulum, if you will, that says from the world, we're taking it back. And I don't know what the next four years are going to look like. But I know who's in control. And I know that there's some uncertainty. But I wonder in my heart of hearts if this wouldn't be a year. Having come off of this messenger in 2020, you can say what you want to about this virus. And I know there's been skepticism. And I know that there are people who think it's a complete hoax. And I know there are people who think it's the end of the world. I fall somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's real and it's killing people. But I also know that it's not going to control us. And yet we find ourselves in this particular place where we have allowed politics and money and people to corrupt the big picture, and that is that God has sent us a message. And the message of God is, is that through a virus and through an economy and through an election and through a, a people, a media, a political system, that God can shake a nation to its core. And we find ourselves perhaps in the same place as this passage of Scripture, that God has come for a season of inspection. And I want you to entertain a few things with me in this passage of Scripture as we look to that. Because this time of inspection is important. Because it speaks to a few things about God. One, I want you to see that God here had been very patient. As the Bible says, this was the third year that he had come to a barren tree. And for three years now, this tree, for which his purpose had been completely void. This tree served one purpose, and that was to be a fig tree. The church serves one purpose, and that is not to entertain people. And that is not to make you feel gooey and good and happy inside. The church has a purpose, and that purpose is the advancement of the gospel and the standing on of the principles of the Bible at all costs for us as a people. The Bible is the centerpiece of everything that we do. And I wonder today if this inspection came to Antioch. The Bible says in John 15, 8, that herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Yet three years in a row, the owner of the vineyard comes and there's no figs on the tree. He, he looks for something for which that fig tree was planted. And it's not there. So I want you to question this this morning. Ask yourself this question. Who am I? And what's your answer? And the second thing I want you to ask yourself is this. What's my purpose? Because there are people who spend their entire lives chasing their tails with no clue what the answer is to those two questions. There are people who think money is the answer until they get the money and they find out, like my homie, more money, more problems. Anybody in the, nobody? Y'all been, nobody else? Okay. We think we need stuff. We think we need substance. We think we need experience until we have it. And then we find out that it's not enough. Nothing will satisfy your soul like a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a child of God, when you come into that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that relationship is not going to be everything it can be unless you attend to it. Jesus wants you to bear fruit of the relationship of God. And by the way, this fruit that he's calling us to bear is not necessarily fruit that only heralds his name, but it's fruit that in heralding and celebrating his name also brings us great satisfaction in this life as we find. That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith. Against such there's no law. These are wonderful things for each of us to have in our lives. Not only to the benefit of glorifying God, but to the benefit of being able to live our lives peaceably and in harmony to do what God's called us to do. So when this inspection came, he comes to the vineyard. He looks there and finds no fruit. And he turns to the dresser of the vineyard. And I don't know why this verse just sent chills to my spine 
when I heard the voice of the one who owned the place, when I heard the voice of God, looks to the vine dresser because of the fruitless tree, and he said, cut it down. Why is it troubling the ground? And I wonder how God has not in this time looked so often upon our country, <coughs> looked at so many of our churches, looked at people like me and you, when we've lived our lives in rebellion, when we've lived our lives in apathy, when we've lived our lives aside or outside of the things of God, how would God not look at us and say the same? You see throughout the Old Testament that God was a God, and He still is, a God of justice, a God of order, a, a God of perfection, a God of purity, a God in whose presence there was no allowance for sin. But yet we step into the New Testament and we see that that God that could almost be labeled a God of grief turns a page and becomes a God of grace. In that now we have the privilege of being dealt with by God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of what Jesus does for us, now God is able to have this place, if you will, of patience and long-suffering because of Jesus Christ. Because we find that Jesus it was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he tells us to come to him. That we don't have a high priest that's not touched by the feeling of our infirmity. He knows what we go through. He knows our suffering. So he invites us to come to him. So God now dealing with us through grace gives us the opportunity to right our wrongs. We come into a new year and we ask ourselves these questions. Who are we? And what is our purpose? God left us here for a reason. God's given us another chance. Can I share something with you? I read this quote this week. It says that we're either moving forward or we're falling back. We're either climbing or we're falling. We're either winning or we're losing. Static Christianity is a delusion. And that word static is talking about status quo. That means an idle Christian is a delusion. You need to understand that if you're not doing anything for God, then you're opposing God. Hear that? You're not advancing with God, you're opposing God. And so our desire is to be what God wants us to be. I want you to, for just a second, grasp this with me. This could have been the biggest, prettiest tree in all the garden. This could have been a strong tree. This could have been a tree that provided shade, that provided rest. But it was a tree that wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. See, it doesn't matter how good we look. It doesn't matter how big the building. It doesn't matter how, how great we are in our oratory. It doesn't matter how well we speak or how moving and passionate our speeches may be. If we're not bearing fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're failing at our purpose for existence. So he walks up to this tree for the third year in a row. And upon inspection time, he recognizes the same thing that he did the year before. Can I ask you this? Would it be the case if God came to your house today? That God would walk in and look around and realize it's just like it was. The stuff that should have been done has not been done. The stuff that should have been quit has not been quit. The changes that should have been made have not been made. And in frustration, and in, I believe, sadness, the guy says, cut down the tree. It's trouble in the ground. I wonder what our country looks like in the eyes of God. And how long can we continue on this trek? When we used to send out aid and support and love and ministry. Now we pass stimulus bills where we help other countries study their gender. Without being crude, for five dollars I can tell you what you are. <laughs> now we're funding this kind of foolishness with your money. That's what we're sending out into the world today. How long is God going to let us go? How long is God going to ask this question? Or how long before God asks this question? Cut it down. Why is it trouble in the ground? 
How long does God look at a church that lives in rebellion, that lives in apathy, that lives in celebrated and accepted sin before he says, cut it down? It's trouble in the ground. How long does God look at these seats and ask the question, how long are we going to let this stand? <laughs> cut it down. It's trouble in the pew that it's sitting on. But then... After the inspection, you see that there was intercession. Because God is 100% right to look at me and say, he's a lost cause. Cut him down. He's worthless. Do rid with him. He's a sinner. He can't get right. He won't do right. Be gone. But there's one that stands between the vine dresser speaks up. And not to challenge the owner of the vineyard, but to at least call to his attention that there is work that could be done that could change everything. The intercessor speaks. Much like the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes in the midst of our sorrow and brings us from grief to grace. He brings us from barrenness to to blessedness. From the gutter to the uttermost. He helps us through our challenges and through our trials. And where there was every reason in the world for God to say, do rid with me. Do rid with this church. Do rid with this country. There's one who's kept the door open. There's one who's kept us alive and standing. There's one who's kept us out of hell. There's one who's given us one more year. His name is Jesus Christ. Do you know him? So he comes before this owner, or Lord, if you will, of the vineyard. And in verse 8, he answers and he says to him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it about and dump it. What Jesus is saying is before we do rid with this fruitless tree, let me do a work in it. Let me have it. Let me help. Let me, let me dig and let me fertilize. Just, just this expression means that Jesus is saying, let me take away what doesn't need to be there. What's hindered its growth and quenched its fruitfulness. I'll remove that. Let me dig it. And then let me fertilize it. Because Jesus Christ is never going to take anything out of your life and leave you with a hole. He's not going to remove something from you and leave you void. But rather, Jesus wants to take away what's doing you harm and replace it with what can help you. Jesus said, let me dig it. Let me fertilize it. Let me do a work. You see, there may be barren trees in this room this morning. There may be unfruitful vessels in the church today. But there's not a one that Jesus can't do a work in and bring fruit from in this coming year. Amen. Give me another chance. Give me another year. Let me help it. He said, I can take away the impurities. There's something around this tree that's preventing it from being fruitful. There's something in the life in the root system, in the structure that's kept it from flourishing. Jesus said, let me work. <laughs> he looks at us today and where it'd be so easy for maybe others, maybe even pastors, maybe friends, parents, brothers, sisters, loved ones, looking at us judgmentally and saying they never do anything for God. Jesus said, let me fix it. Jesus said, I can help Jesus is laying his entire reputation on the line. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning. But if you're still drawing breath, God's got a plan for you. If you're still here today, God's got a plan for you. If you're here today, there stands a chance that you've given God a reason to give up on you. If you're like me, You've probably given him multiple reasons to give up on you. But you're here today as a testimony that he hadn't. 
You're here today as a testimony that the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf has worked and has bent the ear of a holy God and that's why you're here. You're not here today to go enjoy the things of this world. You're not here today to be able to go out and do all the things that you want to do. You're here today for the plan and the purpose and the good pleasure of God and you'll never find happiness, you'll never find satisfaction until you get in the will of God and do what God put you here to do. Amen. That could have been the biggest tree, could have been the most spectacular tree. People may have drove for miles and miles to see that tree, but at the end of the day, it was not doing what it was made to do. You can have everything, experience everything, see everything. But if you're not doing what God put you on this earth to do, you're barren and broken and you're taking up good dirt. But Jesus can help you. Let him work. Let him come in. Let him dig. He'll take away the things that have robbed you. The sin, the bitterness, the hatred, the callous. The brokenness, the reputation. Oh, you've got people that talk about you. You've got people that think bad of you. You know, the funny thing is, they could say the worst thing in the world about you, and it still wouldn't be bad enough. We're sinners. Guilty. If you hear something bad about me, don't argue. Because even if it's not accurate, it's probably not bad enough to really describe what I am without God. But Jesus said, let me work. And the fact that you're drawing breath is the fact that he hadn't cut you down yet. The fact that you still got a pulse is the fact that God's not through with you. So let him work. Don't stand in obstinance to the things of God. Don't stand there letting your leaves flutter in the wind. If there's no fruit, then let him work. Let him come in. There are some things that need to be removed. There are some things that need to be dealt with. There is sin in your life, sin in our homes, sin in the church. And as long as it's there, we'll never bear the fruit that we've been called to bear. As long as there are hindrances and obstacles that we have allowed to come in, as long as we give way to the devil and let him have a foothold in our life, gentlemen, as long as you stay on the internet looking at women that don't belong to you, your marriage and your happiness is never going to be there. Don't nobody say amen right there then. We'll jump ship and preach on that the rest of the service. It's an epidemic. And we're suffering because of it. We need men to be men again. Men to love their wives like Christ loved the church. We need men to be leaders. We need women to stand strong. Excuse me, boy, I choke on my own tongue. Stand strong and do what God's put us here to do. To live a life in the fear of God, representing the things of God, living our lives according to the word of God. We've got everything pulling at us now. Everything from the world. There are things that are pulling you aside sexually. There are things pulling you aside emotionally. Things that are pulling you aside physically. The devil's got a hundred tentacles out doing everything he can to destroy you. And all you've got to do is take the hand of one of them. And he can keep you from being fruitful. Jesus said, let me work. God looks at a barren vessel and says, there's no use. But Jesus said, not without me. But God sent his son, and he came to do a work. Let me dig it. Let me fertilize. Let me take what doesn't need to be there and replace it with what does need to be there. And then Jesus lays his entire work his reputation, if you will, on the line. And I want to double down on that this morning. Are you ready? Hear me. If you let him work, it'll work. I, I, put, I put everything on the line. I lay my reputation as a pastor, a preacher, a Christian, everything I know. I lay it out on the table, and I promise you, on everything I can put on, on, on at risk, I'm telling you, if you let Christ work in your life, it'll work. Apply it to anything. Marriage, finance, life, emotional, whatever. If you give Jesus the reign, 
Watch what happened. He gave us one more year. Who had a good 2020? None of us. But a lot of good happened. Amen? So it was down. It was trouble. It was hard. Boo-hoo. We've lived too good all of our lives. Maybe we needed a good hard year to put us back in a place where we recognize every year is a gift. Three years of barrenness. God said cut it down. Do you know who was glad to have another year? This tree. <laughs> he heard the saws cranking up. But then Jesus stepped in. And Jesus went so far at this inspection to, to lay down in intercession this heart that only the Lord has that he looks at somebody that's of no worth, of no value, of no anything and says, I can fix it. And then he promises the Lord of the vineyard to come back and come back with expectancy. Y'all heard me quote Charles Spurgeon, if not weekly, bi-weekly for seven years. He's one of the greats. Just a man, but one of the greats. Spurgeon was addressing a room full of pastors. They had a pastor's college there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. And after the address, he had a young man come in his office. And he said to Spurgeon, I pray, I prepare, I preach, and nothing happens. And Spurgeon sat back in his chair and he looked at him and he said, can I ask you something, son? And he said, yes. He said, do you expect God to move every time you preach? And the young man nodded his head and said, no. And he said, that's your problem. Jesus said, you let me work and it'll work. He told the Lord of the vineyard, here's the deal. Give me another year. Anybody need another year? Whew. Give me another year. And when you come back, if it works, good. If it don't, cut it down. Now the reality is the dresser of the vineyard knew that if he could put his hand to this tree, he could fix it. He didn't say this thinking that there was a chance that it wouldn't work. Because if so, he would have found another way to keep that tree from being cut down. But he made this so bold and so clear that if you let me work in this situation, come back, it'll be fixed, or we'll do what you're wanting to do. And I'm telling you, that's what Jesus is saying to us in here this morning. That's what Jesus is saying to the Antioch Baptist Church. That's what Jesus is saying to the United States of America, is if you let me work, it'll work. If you let me do it, it'll work. If you let me move, if you let me speak, while marriages fall by the wayside, while our children are being raised in an atmosphere of sin, Jesus is saying to us, let's let me work. Just give me a chance. Give me an opportunity. Let me come in and do what only I can do. And I'm telling you this morning, please, don't rob your children. Don't rob your home. Don't rob your marriages of the opportunity to let the Lord work. We have to avail ourselves. To give ourselves to God. He's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. It's not because you're strong. Or because you're smart. Or because you're good. It's because there's nothing that we can bring to the table. But he's all of that. He can move. He can save anybody. He can move in every situation. He can make a difference in any endeavor. I don't know what your plan is for 2021. But you better put Jesus at the top of it. If you want 2021 to be the year of blessing that you need it to be. But boy, you put him at the top. Jesus said, let me work and it'll work. And he tells him to come back with expectation. And that's what I want to challenge us with this morning. That we go into this year with expectation. Because a static Christian is a delusion. Can I say this? On a bigger picture, a static church is a delusion. So we got hit. So there's sickness. So there's heartache. There's fear. There's trouble. We've got, we've got political turmoil that we're going to be dealing with this year. Perhaps there's a change of guard that we're going to deal with this year. 
Are we going to sit for 24 hours a day and stare at the news and let them control our emotions? Or are we going to stand up as the church of the living God and remember that the global news might be corruption, but our community still needs us? I can't go to Washington, D.C. unless I get an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. But I can't go to D.C. and overturn what's happening there, but I can still love my neighbor. But I can't love my neighbor as long as I'm sitting on the couch with a cup of coffee <laughs> worried about what's going on in D.C. I had a guy tell me 10 years ago about somebody that got arrested for preaching on a street corner. He said, can you believe they won't even let us preach on a street corner anymore? I said, when's the last time you preached on a street corner? <laughs> we worry about them taking liberties from us we never enjoyed. I said, well, they can't pray at school. You're not praying at home. Huh? Keys in the mailbox. Come on in. Amen? <laughs> Shoe fit. We're worried about what we can't do out there, and it's all hypocrisy because there's stuff out there that we can't do that we're not even worried about doing at home. Stuff we're not even doing at church anymore. Stuff that we don't even do as the people of God. We want the world to act right, and the church won't even act right. We want the world to somehow figure this thing out, and the church is still struggling. Oh, we got big leaves on the tree. Big tree fall hard. We got a strong trunk. We got a big base. We got a root system that would challenge anything in this world. But if there's no fruit... And would just as well be dead. When I was in seminary, me and a group of guys were in there, and there was, there was some churches that would call if they needed a fill-in preacher. They'd call the seminary and ask for guys to come preach. Well, we had a list of preachers. My last name starts with a W, so they would go down the list. Well, I had a Nick Cox and Micah Carter and Josh Llewellyn. These were all guys that preached with David Heiser, Justin Colburn. All these guys were on the list, so they never got to the W. So I didn't get to preach that much. And there was a church in particular that was famed for being rough, rough, rough. They never had a pastor because they run one off every other year. And they went through trouble, trouble, trouble. And so guys would go up there and preach. One guy went up there and he walked in a Sunday school class and sat down. One of the deacons walked in and told him he was in his seat. Get up. That kind of foolishness. In a room with 20 chairs and five people. So that church had a reputation. So we come back to seminary on Monday, and we'd all come back. The guys who got to preach, we're sharing notes, talking about how all these churches were so blessed to have us. <laughs> Y'all missed your chance <laughs> to have some of us back when we knew everything. Well, we were going to change the world, right? And these guys go out and preach. We'd come back, and we'd all talk about this and that. Well, one of our brothers had been at that particular church, and it had a similar Sunday to everybody else that had ever been there. And we walked in that class and sat down and we said, how did it go? Kind of laughing. And he said, it was dead as a hammer. And, and he said, that church is just dead. Dr. Don McCormick, president of the school, was teaching that class that day, Bible analysis. And he got up and walked over and he kicked the stop off the door and shut the door. And he turned around and he pointed at that guy with tears in his eyes and he said, don't you ever call the church of the living God dead. He said, you never tell a man that his wife is dead. And buddy, it sent chills through us. And he went on a rant. And it all ended up at this very same place. And that is that there's nothing that Jesus can't fix. So before we come in as the spiritual coroner and start pronouncing services dead and churches dead and people dead and atmospheres dead, why don't we just look to the one that is life? And let him do the pronouncing. And let's just be sure we don't perish likewise. That we don't fall by the wayside. Because pride comes before a fall. And the second that you think yourself, listen, Galatians 6 says, if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he fools himself. We're one year from barrenness. Or we're one year from blessedness. But the determining factor is going to be what we let Jesus do. And I'm telling you, we've done it our way. We've done it one way. We've done it a church's way. We've done it a preacher's way. We've done it a religion's way. And we've done it a denomination's way. And I don't think it was with any ill intent. <coughs> but if you keep getting, or if you keep wanting what you get and keep doing what you're doing. But if you want something different, you've got to do something different. And I think it's time for a lot of people in this church to quit their sinning and get right with Jesus. I think it's time for a lot of people that's sitting in this building this morning, 
Stop fighting this same fight that we've been fighting all these years. Stop going through these same motions. Stop playing this same game. Swallow your pride and surrender your, surrender your life to the Lord. Or you're going to continue on this treadmill of misery to the day he calls you home. But I promise you this. And I'll agree with the Lord Jesus and lay it all on the line. If you let him work, it'll work. And I don't know how. But I know it to be true. And I promise you, if you'll turn it over to him, he'll make it right. I don't know if you're here today without Christ and maybe need to be saved. If you are, well, you're in the right place. That's good news. Miss Vivian, I'll never forget. Oh, Miss Vivian's not here. She was at the other service. I'll never forget. She was at the doctor with your daddy one day and had a spell. And that doctor came out. Her blood pressure had dropped out. They got her in. And I'll never forget at that hospital that, that doctor came in. And he told her, Miss Vivian, if you wouldn't have been here when that happened, you'd have been in trouble. But she was already at the doctor when she had the spell. And they were able to get her fixed. Listen, you could be on the lake today. You could be in a deer stand today. You could be anywhere in this world today lost and without Christ. And there wouldn't be anything there to change your mind. But if you're here today and you're lost and without Christ, you're in the right place. You could have been anywhere else and died and went to hell. But because you're here today, you can be saved. You can give it to Christ. You can know where you stand for eternity. Your sins can be forgiven. Isn't that good? I don't know if you're here today and you need to be saved, but if you are, I want you to know that you can be. And I lay everything on the line again and tell you that if you come asking him, I promise you he'll do what he said he would do. He'll save you. Maybe you're here today saved person and you're willing to admit I've not been fruitful. I've not been given to the Lord. I've been distracted. I've allowed things to get me down and it's kept me from serving the Lord like I ought to. I want you to know something. The fact that you're here right now means Jesus gave you another year. Let's do what he wants us to do. And let's do it with all of our heart. If we put our hand to it, let's put our hand to it. And let's go for the glory of God. Because time's a waste. And Jesus is coming. And I want us to be found faithful when he comes. Y'all stand with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for one more year. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to right our wrongs. God, we thank you that for those in here today that might have sin in their life, that there's cleansing that's available for us all. We thank you that if there's one here today without Christ that needs to be saved, that there's blood-bought salvation awaiting all those who believe. We'll just come, repent of our sins, and believe on Christ as our Lord and Savior. I thank you today, Lord, that for those of us who've been challenged by these last 12 months, that we've allowed that to creep in and affect us, perhaps emotionally, spiritually, physically. I thank you that today that we can look to your word and recognize that even though we maybe came through a hard time, you've given us a chance to see victory. You've given us another year. Lord, I want us to be fruitful. As a people, I pray that every one of us in here understands that our responsibility and our duty as the people of God today is to nourish our relationship with you so that there might be fruit. And God, I pray today that we'll do all that we can to bear the fruit of the Lord as we go from this place that people might see and run to Jesus for their own salvation. And Lord, we pray this morning for that one that's near as hell that came in here without Christ. Maybe they've been through the motions, walked an aisle. Maybe they repeated a prayer. Maybe they've been baptized. Maybe they've done everything under the sun. But judgment day on us, they can look in their heart right now and they know that there's no relationship with Jesus Christ. You gave them another chance. Lord, we were all sinners. We all deserve to go to hell. But you gave us a chance. And I pray for that one. Or maybe there be many in here today without Christ that they realize that nothing happens by accident. That this was a divine appointment. And this is their chance. This is their another year. This is their opportunity to once and for all make things right with a holy God through Jesus Christ. Let somebody be saved today. Be the greatest thing that ever happened in their life. And we'll give you glory for everything that's said and everything that's done in this invitation. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Ms. Wanda begins to play. I want to ask you a question. Nobody's talking, nobody's looking around, wouldn't embarrass.